It is being broadcast live, I think, on Facebook. It will be available on YouTube. Um, I'll ask you to keep your microphones muted for now. Um, later on, when we have the Q&A discussion, um, you can put up your hand and, and unmute. You can also use the chat function or Q&A to, to put questions to us. I'll try and pick them up as well as, as we go along. And I'd ask you um, to be aware of our draconian defamation laws. Uh, see, so Rice smiled from Grania there, um, our former chair. Um, uh, I don't need any sleepless nights um, and um, don't want to solicit this letter on a Friday evening. Um, so if you can, be, be very careful about what you say when, when you are going to unmute um, and, and be aware that we will have to edit it out if our lawyers believe it could be. There's even a risk of, of uh, defaming anyone, so avoid mentioning any names or alluding to anyone who could be identified by virtue of the information that you share with us. So uh, that's something to be aware of. Uh, with, that, with, with that out of the way, um, I'll move quickly on to uh, the agenda and uh, I'll keep you waiting a little while. Uh, for the findings themselves and explain the methodology. Otherwise, you just, you know, you'd, you'd get the findings and then just leave. I mean, what would be the point of hanging around? Um, but um, we'll just explain the background to, 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 to the index the methodology. Uh, the sources, uh, for the first time, we've never really discussed these. Um, it's assumed sometimes that the CPI is a survey in itself. It's not. It's an index of surveys uh, that are aggregated and uh, we, we don't we don't poll or or gather information ourselves other than the information that's gathered by other think tanks and consultancies present the findings talk through some recommendations for reform and then we'll move on to the discussion with rob and the q a as i said i'll try and keep my presentation relatively short um but as I said before, I move on to the, the, the methodology. Um, we should explain um, should explain uh, the background to the to the index and why we do it. It was initially launched in, in 1995 and uh, has been conducted every year since. Uh, I should add as well, or it's not that I should add, but I. I'll say it for the sake of it anyway, but I, I have something of a love-hate relationship with, with this thing. Um, uh, it, it can serve to oversimplify uh, the issue um, by leading some people to assume that because Ireland is generally ranked fairly high, that corruption isn't a problem here, or that in some countries um, corruption is... Uh, an issue that will never be addressed largely because they're seen to or perceived to be low on the index and uh, I will uh, usually find it difficult and very find it uh, difficult for, for different reasons to improve their score or ranking. Uh, there are a number of factors involved. No one country is the same, of course, but uh, it's important to understand the local context when analysing levels of corruption and corruption risk. And it's uh, one of the reasons why we also produce uh, both quantitative and qualitative uh, analysis aimed at understanding the causes and dynamics of corruption in individual countries. So, for example, we've conducted numerous national integrity systems assessments to understand how strong or weak our respective institutions and laws are, what the opportunities and incentives are. A number of us will conduct corruption risk assessments uh, at TI Ireland. Of course, we, we operate the Speak Up helpline and gather information and anonymize the data to understand trends, understand where some of the risks lie um, in, in Irish uh, organizations. Uh, we have we conduct uh, public opinion surveys as well, and most notably uh, the 
global corruption barometer, which uh, measures uh, people's experiences and perceptions of corruption at a national level. Sorry, just, uh, and um, we, there's a lot more work being done behind the scenes um, than perhaps the, the index would lead you to believe. Uh, it, we are best known for, for, the, for the index, and I would not have got involved were it not for it back in 2002 and um, when uh, a charitable trust, a just charitable trust uh, referred to it in a report they published back in 2002, which was picked up by the New Zealand Herald at the time I was working from the Irish consulate down in Auckland, um, read the headline about Ireland being slammed for its record on human rights and corruption and offered to set up a chapter of, of TI here. Um, so um, we could be thankful uh, to, to this index, uh, not just for an Irish chapter, but also for putting corruption on the global agenda. Uh, were it not for, for the index, um, I don't believe we would have built up the momentum at an international level for international conventions such as the UN Convention Against Corruption, regional conventions and others uh, that have uh, helped uh, address uh, the risk of corruption, particularly in international business. Um, I should also add that in the absence of reliable indicators, and this question often comes up, um, the index serves as a proxy for real levels of corruption. We can't tell how corrupt one country is in, in real terms, in actual terms. Um, it's impossible to tell even from, say, prosecution data, how, how corrupt a country is, because some countries may be more proactive in prosecuting corruption than others. Um, and corruption is an insidious phenomenon. It, 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 it is it happens behind closed doors more often than not. Um, although you might see or witness uh, petty predatory corruption involving junior officials, or very often police officers in some parts of the world who, in my experience, have sometimes begged for money or underpaid uh, and used bribery or, or extortion as a means of uh, making ends meet or to profit from their from, from, from public office. So it's really difficult to, to identify real levels or tell how, how uh, corrupt a, a, a country is in, in real terms. So we use perceptions as a, as a proxy. Um, and it's important as I add, uh, as, uh, to, to add that it needs to be complemented by other data that, that, we, that we, we gather in other organizations um, collect as well. So um, the index itself is based on uh, up to 13 different um, data from 13 different sources, data sources. In Ireland's case, we use seven different sources, which I'll explain in a moment. To be included in, in the index, uh, our, our research department uh, determines how reliable uh, the methodology of each of the, the uh, organizations gathering that information is. Uh, they need to be ranking countries and scoring them on the same scale. Um, it needs to be performed by a credible think tank or, uh, or consultancy and um, allow for a sufficient variation of score to, to distinguish between countries. So it, it would be impossible to use the data if, for example, 100 countries were ranked from zero to two, and um, you only had uh, three data points for each country, it would make it very difficult for us to, 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 to extrapolate the data from, from such a survey. Um, it should, each data source should use a, a substantial number of countries and um, use either country expert or, or, or executive opinion uh, data. Uh, the reason why we don't use public opinion is because I mean, it's fairly simple. I couldn't tell you how, or how much more corrupt Benin is than Togo or Mozambique is than Zambia. I've no experience being there. Um, 
I, I haven't been stopped at an airport and asked for a bribe um, at, at, at an airport in any of these countries. I'm not based there. So it's important that people based in those countries are asked uh, who, with experience uh, and some knowledge, comparative knowledge of uh, governance and um, corruption so that we can, we can use comparable data across the world. Um, each uh, source should also be conducting their survey every two years uh, so that we can um, come up with a, uh, a, a reliable average. Um, the, the index uh, scores countries from zero to 100 with uh, a, close, a score close to zero, uh, indicating a country that's perceived to be highly corrupt and a score close to uh, 100, indicating a country that is perceived to be highly clean. Um, should come as no surprise that no country gets 100. Um, this year and previous years, we've uh, conducted the, the survey, or sorry, the index uh, with 180 countries. Um, and um, I'll, I'll present the findings in a moment, but it should also be clear um, uh, or sh for 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 a, a for a country to be included in the index, they must have a minimum of three sources, um, independent sources, for us to be able to uh, to to, to assess the the, the country. Um, uh, the other point as well is that there is a a, a standard error. Um, and, and confidence interval um, uh, included in 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 the in the index and um, the 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 sources should also include uh, that that confidence or or, or, or inform us of the confidence interval as well for us to to be able to reliably uh, use that data. So, as I said, there are seven sources um, used in the in the index for for Ireland, uh, and um, they are uh, the Bertelsmann Foundation, Economist Intelligence Unit, Global Insight, IMD, uh, PRS, Varieties of Democracy Project, and the World Economic Forum Executive Opinion Survey. Some are consultancies, others our academic institutions and think tanks. Uh, briefly, Bertelsmann is a, is a think tank uh, which um, uses, uh, measures corruption in 41 countries. It's using both quantitative data and qualitative expert assessments. And it's asking its respondents to what extent are public office holders prevented from abusing the position for private interests. Um, the Economist Intelligence Unit is the think tank linked to the uh, Economist magazine. And uh, it, it, it is analyzing corruption in 140 countries using expert analysis, um, both uh, at its headquarters in London and in the field. So each country will have a, a respondent or a rapporteur um, answering uh, the questions on the slides there, which I will not read out for, for the sake of time. Um, but I, I can make the slides available later on if you want to use them. And as I said, the, the presentation will be up on, on YouTube as well later. Um, Global Insight is a consultancy and that is um, uh, using analysis, qualitative analysis from uh, country experts in 204 countries. And um, sorry, how, sorry, this is, uh, shouldn't have been bullet pointed, but the, the analysts are asked about the, the risk that companies and individuals will face uh, bribery or corrupt practices to carry out business uh, that might interfere in securing uh, public contracts, whether they will face undue or have to deal with undue red tape in doing business and um, 
whether the uh, whether this will will threaten the, the the company's ability to to operate in the, the country it is based. Uh, IMD, many of you are aware, is a prestigious business school based in Switzerland or IMID, I'm not quite sure. Um, it's Institute for Management Development, I think. Um, but it conducts an executive opinion survey in 63 countries. Uh, so it asks business people um, uh, whether they believe bribery and corruption exists in that country. And um, Again, all the, 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 the data is um, measured or presented on a scale. Uh, and that scale varies usually from zero to four to zero to 10. Um, the PRS is a, um, is a, a consultancy uh, which looks at um, the risk of corruption and asks to what extent is there uh, corruption within the political uh, system. And the Variety of Democracy Project is a, is a an initiative um, based, initiative led by um, three institutes, the University of Gothenburg, University of Notre Dame, they call it, um, this uh, Kellogg at, um, it's a Kellogg Institute at the University of Notre Dame and um, the Fair Varieties of Democracy Institute. And it asks um, its experts uh, how per pervasive is political corruption. It's based on the opinion of 3,000 scholars in 179 countries. Um, and finally, the World Economic Forum um, is asking um, respondents from 134 countries um, uh, 13,000 executives are asked um, about the likelihood that they will have to make undocumented extra payments or bribes related to imports, exports, utilities, awarding of pu public contracts, annual tax payments, uh, or in obtaining judicial decisions, and ask how likely is uh, or are public funds to be essentially diverted or embezzled um, due to, to corruption. Um, I can't show you the, the, the findings of each of these, uh, but the scores range from around 55 to 76 out of 100, with the lowest coming from the Economist Intelligence Unit, which marks us down um, for whatever reason, I'm not quite sure because we don't discuss the findings with, with these experts, we just gather the data. Um, but um, the scores uh, are, are the mean of, of uh, each, uh, from, from each score is, is gathered and divided by the standard deviation to come up with the score for, for Ireland. Uh, before I move on to the findings, um, a country, as so to remind you, a country which is um, which scores close to one hundred is perceived to be highly clean, and co score close to zero, highly corrupt, and uh, this is represented in uh, in this map, um, and you can see that generally speaking, uh, countries um, with lower incomes and uh, in the Global South in particular, but also in um, the former um, Soviet republics are, uh, are perceived to be the, and, and South Asia are perceived to be the, 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 the most affected by, by corruption. Um, and here are the scores for and rankings for 2020. Um, Denmark uh, and New Zealand top the index again, this year. Hope your screens are big enough, by the way. Um, I wasn't able to make this well. I could make them bigger, but just wanted to show them on, on one screen. Um, the, the scores range from 88 down to 12 with Denmark and New Zealand, uh, again in first position. And Somalia and South Sudan um, at 
the bottom with a score of 12 out of uh, 100. Ireland is in 72nd, or sorry, it's in 20, um, 20th position with a score of 72. Um, we uh, are just above the average, our score is just above the average European, European Union average. Um, and uh, we have again um, uh, scored uh, more poorly than most for European and Northern European counterparts, including the UK, um, which was something of a surprise to me given everything going on there at the moment, um, where so called democracy, euphemism for, for corruption, really. Uh, has become endemic in Westminster and Whitehall to a large degree with the award of public contracts uh, and uh, favoritism in appointments. Um, we can discuss the, why, why this might be the case in a moment. Um, but you'll see from the next slide that Ireland's score and ranking uh, score hasn't improved all that much since 2012. In 2012, um, uh, we were uh, we we uh, scored quite poorly. We, we saw a, a rather sharp dip in our score, um, which coincided with the launch of the both the Mahan and Moriarty tribunals. Make it clear that no one named in those tribunals um, is to blame for Ireland's score. Um, I can't attribute it to any individual or event, um, but it coincided with Ireland, the, this dip in, in, in our score and uh, ranking coincided with the launch of those tribunal reports. And we've struggled to, to recover ever since, but it should be a borne in mind that even before then, uh, we weren't scoring much more highly uh, than we did in, in 2012. And our scores remain stable in, in the low 70s. Um, I kind of misrepresent our ranking here suggests that um, we we were better um, in 2012 than we are now. The rank isn't so important, um, I should add. Uh, in 2012, we were in 25th position, meaning we were the, considered to be the 25th or perceived to be the 25th least corrupt country in the world. Um, we are now in 20th position. It doesn't matter nearly as much as, as the score. So what can we do about these perceptions? Well, some degree, um, not much. Some of the um, some some perceptions will be difficult to to overcome, and there's much for net, if, there's much to be done to communicate our commitment to tackling corruption in Ireland. Um, I. It won't necessarily, even if we do make changes, it won't necessarily be seen in our uh, index in the next couple of years. But over time, we may see, like we did in Georgia, the Republic of Georgia, uh, a, a, a big improvement in international persons if we are seen to uh, both prevent and uh, tackle corruption. And there are a no number of initiatives which we've been highlighting for some time, which we believe would help um, repair our, int our international um, reputation, repair the damage that was done um, by endemic, what was described by the man tribunal as endemic corruption in, in Irish politics. Um, and to, to do so, we, we could start by uh, implementing some of the recommendations from that tribunal, including the uh, Public Sector Standards Bill, which lapsed uh, at the last general election. It had been on the order paper of the Dáil, had been uh, in front of the Finance Committee for three years, uh, and without any explanation was dropped. Um, and that would have provided for the strengthening of the and reorganization of the Standards and Public Office Commission would have replaced the commission with a commissioner, uh, would have been responsible for deciding on whether an investigation uh, takes place or not. Um, and it would have required 
our public representatives to share much more information about their financial interests, including loans, which are often used to bribe uh, public officials. Uh, it's, it's very rare that if, if money is hand passed in, in brown envelopes or in suitcases, it's just as easy to lend someone money. Uh, and then when they're caught, claim, you know, that was a, you know, they were, they were looking for a bailout or they were friends just giving them, giving, helping them through a hard time. Um, so uh, this information ought to have been disclosed by now. It's not. And the information should also be in machine readable form. It should, you shouldn't um, require politicians, uh, particularly given the fact that we're now in, in, in the second decade of the 21st century, to be filling in uh, paper forms and then scanning them um, and, and, and sending them to uh, the Standards of Public Office Commission. Um, they should be entering this information on a on an online database and um in much the same way you do if you 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 you're, you're making a return to the company registrations office but there has been political opposition to this um and uh government has to give it its due it promised under the program for government to introduce a new ethics legislation however we see no reason why uh the public sector standards bill cannot be reintroduced in its current form. Uh, secondly, uh, we need to see strengthening of the lobbying regulation of lobbying act. We saw recently how a former minister of state was able to move to a, um, a lobbying organization soon after uh, stepping down um, or losing a seat. And um, in spite of the fact that being an offense the public, the, the the lobbying regulator was unable to to take any action, and that's in large part because of a lacuna, which had been highlighted, a lacuna in the law, which had been already highlighted by by the Standards and Public Office Commission. So we need to see uh, a closer scrutiny of that act and reforms aimed at closing those loopholes. Uh, I don't think um, I'm exaggerating when I say that it, it does untold damage to uh, credibility of the legislation and confidence in um, government's ability to, to regulate itself. Um, it's been some time since we um, drafted or published, the government published a, a national action plan for the Open Government Partnership. The OGP uh, was launched in 2011 by Barack Obama. Ireland subscribed, signed up to the partnership in 2013, produced a, a plan making various commitments to making government more open, transparent, accountable, uh, publishing more data and um, making commitments to, to um, improve our FOI uh, and so on. And unfortunately, we've fallen behind and at risk of being kicked out of the partnership because we've yet to produce a new national action plan and it appears to have fallen down the list of political priorities. Um, Rob and I, I guess Rob, I'll, I'll turn to you in a moment to talk about your thoughts on the Hamilton Review as well, but the Department of Justice recently, just before the turn of the year, published its, its, its review and recommendations on how uh, we might tackle white collar crime and corruption. And there are some welcome recommendations in there um, but one of which was excluded was uh, one that we'd made um, and we have been calling for a National Anti-Corruption Bureau or recommended that the state establish an independent bureau similar to the uh, Criminal Assets Bureau to tackle complex high level uh, political corruption, those cases that the Standards Public Office Commission or the Guardian would be ill-placed or ill-resourced to, to deal with as such uh, agencies are commonplace, even in other common law jurisdictions in Australia, uh, there are federal anti-corruption agencies, but also to, to, to be clear, uh, deal with police corruption, uh, but also deal with uh, political corruption too. And um, if you contrast our, our um, in the, the level of resourcing in Ireland to that, for instance, of um, 
Hong Kong with a similar population. Um, it, 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 the, the contrast is quite stark. We have around 15 to 20 staff based in the Standards and Public Office Commission and 1,400 staff at the Independent Anti-Corruption Commission in Hong Kong. So um, it's important that resources be ring-fenced and that we have a dedicated unit and bureau uh, that will, will tackle corruption. Uh, in the meantime, we also need to see existing agencies properly resourced, including the National uh, Guard Econ National Economic Crime Bureau, formerly known as the Fraud Squad, uh, which has also set up uh, its own anti-corruption unit. Uh, but in the last I heard, it had about um, it had less than five staff. This this unit had, had less than five staff and, the, and the, an answering machine to take calls from from members of the public reporting corruption. Um, we need much more. We need a dedicated agency, and in the absence of a dedicated agency, uh, the guard need to be undertaking intelligence-led. Um, anti-corruption police work and working closely with other agencies, including the Revenue Commissioners and the Standards and Public Office Commission to identify red flags uh, and to, to monitor them closely. In the absence of that, um, I fear that we will continue to underperform on indices like the, the CPI and our commitments to um, to, to tackling corruption will um, fail to convince international and domestic observers and should wrap up by saying it's domestic observers that, that matter the most. Um, we have uh, a duty, the state has a duty to restore confidence um, in its ability to tackle abuse in, in public office. Um, we can't afford to take public confidence for granted in, in democratic norms and our instance, uh, particularly uh, the times we, we live in. So uh, that's it from me, I think. Yeah, um, thank you for um, listening. And um, Rob, I'll just turn to you, um, the, your thoughts and the findings and, and um, what you think and in addition to what I've, I've laid out here, might need to be done to, 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 to address these, these rather mediocre, uh, underwhelming uh, results. Right. Uh, thanks, John, uh, for, for having me along to, to, to share the, the launch of CPI. Like you, I have a complicated relationship with CPI in that I, I think it's, it's a really valuable thing. You know, it, it, it launched a huge wave of academic research. And it, I think we've learned a lot from studying uh, the index and, and similar products, um, but also it has its, its limitations. But that said, and we could talk for a long time about various kind of computational limitations and methodological limitations of the index, um, we do know it matters, right? I mean, there's a fairly consistent set of findings in social science, economics, political science, international business, and kind of related disciplines um, that, you know, multinational firms, investors, do not like corruption and one of the the, 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 the inputs into their decision-making process seems to be the CPI. In other words, it's important to us that we continue to do well on the CPI because of our, you know, fairly special uh, little economic model that we have going on here. So it is important that we, we, we try and do better on the CPI. That's the kind of the mercenary, um, the mercenary view of this thing. But it's also important that we, we don't lose track of all the the terrible ways in which corruption undermines societies as well. Um, perceptions of corruption amongst the populace are associated with you know, tolerance for, for populist viewpoints, um, uh, increasing, act, increasing acceptance of violence, uh, some work that we did uh, in the Anti-Corruption Research Centre with some colleagues in the States. Um, we published recently, we found that uh, you know, using kind of cell phone data from the US, you can see that more corrupt states within the US had lower compliance with shelter in place orders, their kind of version of lockdown. Uh, so corruption you know, undermines or the perceptions of corruption held by the populace undermine the kind of the efficient functioning and smooth functioning, and, and, you know, socially desirable functioning of the of a society. So it, you know, I agree, agree entirely that with the kind of state admission of TI, TI Ireland that we need to 
take this stuff seriously. And the CPI gives us a great launching pad to have this kind of discussion um, about what we can do. Um, in terms of the recommendations, I'm trying to remember which ones you had up on screen. I, I agree with all of them and try and find something you didn't you didn't offer. Uh, the public sector standards thing is, is, a, is a long running fiasco and it's something that we need to, to, to get on top of. Um, the Group of States Against Corruption, Greco, um, in their recent evaluation of Ireland downgraded us on two of their recommendations from partly implemented uh, to not implemented. This, again, this is something that matters um, because some of the way these experts who feed into the CPI who in turn feed into investors and so on make their decision is by looking at what institutions like Greco think of us. Um, and these are real experts in corruption um, who, who, are, who are paying attention to what the state is doing or not doing. So I think that, you know, I agree, the public sector standards thing has to, to come up. The resources is another um, is another another kind of long running sad story. I think my last understanding of the anti-corruption was three people. Uh, John, maybe it's gone up to four or five since, uh, but it, it, you know, it's a small- I've been generous. Rob, I, I wasn't quite sure they, they may have they may have um, recruited one or two more people. Yeah, they do great work, but you know it's it's you know it's not that small a country that three people can effectively um, cover everything that might be worth looking into. Um, the SIPO issue as well, and the various lacunas as you call them, and uh, one whereby if you resign your office or you resign from the doll, no one can look into you, uh, is is another kind of troubling get out of investigation free card and uh, that we should we should do something about and um, something that John didn't mention and then again informed by some of the research we've done in the the in the anti-corruption research center at DCU is that one of the best kind of bulwarks a country can have against corruption is a is a free press and we we do okay uh, on those kind of metrics reporters our borders puts us you know, kind of around 18th to 20th in terms of how free our press is, but there is more that we could do uh, to, to free up the press. I mean, the, the, the idea here is that the you know kind of the media has a nice uh, incentive to expose corruption uh, and report on it, and that has a disciplining effect on people who don't want to lose their reputation or get into legal peril. <clears throat> um, um, so what we could do there is kind of what John started off this talk about. Uh, do something about our defamation laws, which have a chilling effect on whatever their good side, whatever their intended good uh, consequences. They have the undesirable consequences of, of shutting down a bit of discussion about important things that matter for the, for, for again, for the smooth and, and efficient functioning of society and the economy. So I would, I always, you know, think that we, we need to, to take the, the, the defamation stuff very seriously and, and put that alongside all the other reforms um, that you can see uh, uh, <clears throat> report. Um, I think uh, just maybe because we, you know, we could talk about what we like and don't like about the Hamilton report for, for a long time. John, one thing that, again, I was quite happy to see is in my role as an academic and kind of co-director of an anti-corruption research center is this idea in the Hamilton report that comes through in a few of its recommendations that we need to collect better data and we need to put our kind of anti-corruption policy making on an evidence evidential basis in order we need to find out exactly where the corruption is in our society um, quantify it uh, and then design interventions based on legal principles uh, but also on things like behavioral economics uh, insights from behavioral economics to kind of you know, nudge people into doing the right thing and um, I think there's a there's a huge scope for for that kind of work to, to lead to tangible improvements for, for Irish society. And it's it's to be welcomed that it's in the Hamilton Report. Yeah. I mean, we got a question from Angela. Just on the, we got a couple of questions as well, one from Nicholas as well, uh, related to the methodology. But Angela was, uh, Angela was asking, what is the most common form of corruption in Ireland and has it remained consistent? Well, I mean, you probably have a, you're closer to the coalface on, on, on this than I am. I mean, my answer is we need to do more work to find out exactly that. Like there's the kind of coziness and so on that makes the, the media. But we don't really have a great idea about what's going on um, in a systematic, we don't have a systematic way of finding out what's going on in local authorities besides 
you know, again, John has a, and his team have their, their national integrity index, which is great, but it's more, I guess, a focus on transparency rather than the kind of the kind of trying to measure corruption. But we, we could do that. There are ways to design meaningful surveys that give you at least a, a good sense of, you know, where people are being asked for bribes. What are they being asked for bribes for? Nepotism, again, it was great to see in the Hamilton report and in some of the new Charter Ethics stuff that's come out, a focus on other modalities of corruption. It goes beyond just taking bribes or embezzling money. Um, you know, nepotism, um, exploiting your position, um, to, to kind of extract sexual favors from, from witnesses or people further down the hierarchy than you. All of these things are, are forms of corruption. Um, and we should rather than try to boil it all down to one number, which is a useful, as I said, kind of exercise for, for focusing our attention, we should try and dig down and measure all of these different types of corruption and see what is giving rise to some of them being more prevalent in one place uh, than in another. And I think, again, the tell the social science angle we can do that if we if we if we devote a bit of money and time to doing so yeah i i just um the yeah i i noted going back to in april of last year april <laughs> may when we were undertaking or leading some work doing some work around COVID 19 and uh, guidance for employees reporting concerns during the, the pandemic uh, how many cases were coming through our partner, uh, our partners that protect formerly public concern at work, the whistleblower charity there, um, about abuse of the furlough system, uh, the furlough scheme uh, run by the, uh, I think it's the HMRC, the, the, the revenue uh, commissioners in, in the UK. There were thousands of reports of abuse of the furlough scheme by employers not by employees, but employers who were insisting that their staff continue working during the pandemic while they were collecting these pandemic payments. Now, I haven't heard a single report, even through our helpline, I don't think we've, we've had a report. I mean, we get people, you know, sometimes we get a lot of calls from, from the help, from the HSE and elsewhere, you know, largely related to patient safety, sometimes related to fraud, but I haven't come across a single case similar to, to, to the furlough, uh, similar to, to, to the allegations uh, surrounding the furlough um, uh, scheme in the UK here. That doesn't mean that it's not happening. Um, and but we, we often, we, we, we often um, point out that we're, we're as concerned with the risk of corruption as we are with, 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 actual incidents of corruption because there's so much we will never see uh, and we we can determine the risk of corruption by looking at incentives opportunities for for corruption and inclination uh, Robert you alluded to uh, which can be measured by uh, attitudinal research or, 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 or data I mean people are often asked you know how um, do you think it's ever acceptable to pay a bribe? You know that kind of question will 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 um, identify prevailing attitudes and the inclination of people to to engage in corruption. Um, but we spoke before we came on, Rob, about organisations being corruptible, mm. and that's just as important if you, uh, as as identifying individual incidents of corruption because we want to be able to prevent it from happening in the first place. Absolutely. I mean, there is this worrying set of findings um, in the literature um, that is much, much easier to move towards being corrupt than it is to move away from being corrupt. In other words, they, you know, to use the jargon, the kind of anti-corruption equilibrium is very frail. Right. Um, and you can yeah. quickly see a deterioration that is hard to, to ever really get back from and that's why we need to not just yeah design our institutions in a robust After what sorry uh, yeah. uh peter we get you to mute your microphone sorry Raul, go on ahead you can't just design our institutions in a robust way we have to be cognizant of the fact that a lot of money and other perks is at stake for people who are willing to engage in corruption and they will 
over time either move on to, to infect a new institution or they'll find a way to, 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 to break down the barriers you put in place. In other words, you need a kind of a process of continual and constant uh, vigilance and reform if you really want to preserve um, preserve your, you know, again, your economy and your society because corruption is, is a plague, a virus that spreads quite quickly and infects the whole body if you allow it. To. I mean, we saw this in post-Soviet Russia as well. I mean, uh, in particular, where, where the state where, where, where the political elite has protected itself through systemic corruption. Um, and um, it, it's not the only country where, in which that has happened. Yeah. Um, we saw it here to some okay. degree in the 70s and 80s, right through to the 90s. Um, certainly not to the same degree, but it is infectious. Yeah, yeah, and there's, there's worrying signs the beginnings of a, of a worrying trend in eurobarometer data that asks the attitudinal questions you you mentioned to earlier about you know does ask people in ireland how acceptable is it to give bribes or gifts to to get various things we're still doing pretty well overall on that but there has been between 2017 and 2019 a drop in the number of people who tell you it's never acceptable to give a bribe or pay a gift now again if you buy into the idea that that equilibrium once you, you knock it uh, from its from its lofty perch will collapse quite quickly that's something we need to get in front of and again something that was in the hamilton report and, and again something that that ti ireland do quite well uh, it, we need to shore up our kind of anti-corruption norms or anti-corruption immune systems by public education outreach and we need to make sure that people and politicians and businesses fully appreciate how it's in all of our interests to stop this uh, this cancer of corruption taking firm roots in our society, um, um, because it can be a term it can lead to terminal decline. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks, Rob. Uh, Nicholas, I'll just quickly turn to your question for opening up more widely. Um, the you you're asking. You say, I see the obvious benefit of various independent organizations making assessments of corruption. My question is, do they all use an internationally agreed measurement of transparency and accountability? Is there such a thing, a global transparency value or measure? Um, well, they all have their own um, interpretation of um, uh, what is and is not corruption. Many of them, as I said, the likes of the Economist Intelligence, or not sorry, the, the World Economic Forum and IMD will use executive opinion surveys to ask a question of business people with experience in, in, in confronting corruption in, 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 in countries, whereas some will use qualitative analysis and uh, that, they, that, that information is then um, uh, interpreted using data. Uh, the, the, those, the, the, those, that that information will be um, will, will be captured uh, on a scale, uh, which we then have to to aggregate. And um, uh, what we also find is that there seems to be some consistency between the, the scores. So Ireland's score on um, IMD or uh, the Economist Intelligence Unit is the one, it's actually the one outlier here. Most of them will rank us relatively highly, I mean, over 70 out of 100, if you, if you, if you break it down to a you use a, a 0 to 100 scale. Uh, the Economist Intelligence Unit um, uh, gives us a score around 55, which is very low. Um, why that is the case, I'm not quite sure. As I said, we haven't discussed it. I haven't seen the, the analysis. Uh, it's behind a, a paywall. Um, so it's very difficult to tell. Um, but there is no one standard I should add. I mean, there are international standards. You know, we're, we're, we, we have a UN Convention Against Corruption to which 200 countries have, have signed up and, and most have ratified. Uh, criminalizing corruption so there are international legal standards in place but when it comes to measuring corruption you know it, it, it is an imprecise science 
or an inexact science. Um, it certainly is if you try and if you try and lump everything into into one catch-all measure. I mean, we can't quite accurately measure, uh, you know, the prevalence of bribery in particular sectors in particular countries, say, or you know how many people in in a particular uh, region have had to pay a bribe to get their kids into school. We can, you know, if you want to go down to measuring bribery or measuring embezzlement, you can use kind of accounting. Or if you want to measure uh, procurement risks, again, you can, you know, you can, if you've got a good data system, you can do that. But the idea that you can measure a corruption with one catch-all number, as John says, is, is you know, you're thinking about a proxy measure um, that's going to take into account a lot of different conceptions as to, to what we'll classify as, as corruption and what won't. Yeah, I mean, the Euro barometer and our own the global corruption barometer um, are, are useful in, in helping us understand the public's experience of, of corruption. Um, there is a margin of error, which means that, as in the case of Ireland, for instance, um, the, the numbers suggest that the problem, the numbers are negligible. Uh, you know, the, the num I think the last time I looked, um, at the last time the GCB, the barometer was conducted here, only 4% of people said they had paid a bribe compared to, let's say, 50% in India. Um, so, um, I mean, given the margin of error, that means no one might have paid a bribe uh, here. So it's, it's very difficult. Um, it, it's very difficult to tell one way or the other. And, and the public in, in Ireland, are less able, given that they're not as uh, exposed to petty corruption. You know, you're not going to be stopped in the street, or you're not going to be pulled over by a guard and asked for a bribe. I, it's, it's, if it happens, it, it, it's so rare that it happens that it's it, it's not a, a, a problem really that is is um, is worth investing too much resources in. The the point is, well, I mean. They should add that the Gardaí have just established an in internal anti-corruption unit, which is a welcome development. Uh, and it does happen here, of course, but I think I think it happens at a higher level. Um, and you're seeing now investigations into alleged collusion between um, criminal gangs uh, in Limerick and Munster, in the Munster region, between senior, uh, pretty high-level Gardaí uh, and... Um, and organized crime, which happens everywhere. Uh, not to suggest that anyone is guilty of an offense, be clear, but you know, the fact that those investigations are, are happening indicates a risk uh, of happening. And uh, the, the uh, point is that we're not as prey to, to petty corruption as in other countries, and therefore the public have less knowledge of corruption here than they might do in parts of the world where where public officials are prone to abusing, junior public officials are prone, you know, even teachers in some cases, we, and doctors, you know, take bribes in Greece. We hear a lot of, quite a bit of, there's a lot of evidence coming from the Balkans and uh, places like Greece uh, about uh, extortion and solicitation from doctors and, and, and teachers. Um, John, uh, Philip, you, you were asking there about um, the OGP action plan. I've no idea uh, when they're due to publish anything, something we need to check in with them about. Um, but it, it, there's so little awareness at a political level of this that it, it is a concern. And uh, so not, uh, not that much interest. We saw from, from previous... Um, in 2016, we did an analysis of party commitments to tackling corruption and promoting open government. And many of the political parties didn't publish any commitments at all. And it completely slipped off the agenda at the last general election. There were barely any, there was barely any mention of the need to, to address this issue or to make more commitments to, to opening government. In part because they seem to think that they've ticked the box with, you know, the Protective Disclosures Act and the Regulation of Lobbying Act and you now the, the Criminal Justice Corruption Offences Act in 2018. You know, reform is an ongoing process. You can't rest on your laurels, assume that you've 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 plugged all the gaps um, and 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 addressed every risk. You need to be keeping an eye out uh, for this. Uh, to, 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 you need to be to, to be monitoring trends and. Um, 
continually looking about and looking at how you can improve but for that to happen it needs to be a political priority and, and, and unfortunately the OGP isn't um, but we'll let you know as soon as we hear more um, um, Mark asks how aware do you think corporations and employees are to the new anti-corruption legislation in Ireland and a speak out or speak up initiative uh, by TR not very much we conduct uh, just to answer the second part of that, we conduct a um, survey of um, staff in or ask uh, organizations particip participating in an integrity of work uh, initiative with employers as to their awareness of the Speak Up helpline and even amongst employers who are participating in it, and uh, the awareness is still too low. Um, there's a lot to be done. Um, to make people aware of, of that service. Likewise, a lot to be done to make people aware of um, new anti-corruption legislation to give the Department of Justice some credit as well. It has improved its, um, anti, I think it's anti-corruption.ie website, uh, which has more information than it used to have on, on um, anti-corruption law and uh, commitments here. Um, but until we start seeing prosecutions under that act, um, as was the case in the UK with the Bribery Act uh, introduced in 2010 or the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act introduced in 1977 in the US, until we see companies prosecuted, people going to jail, we're, we're not going to, we're, 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 we, I, I don't think people are gonna sit up and pay much attention. Legislation can sit in the statute books and not be used and um, it doesn't amount to much more than the paper is written on ultimately if it's not enforced. Um, great, so um, I, uh, I'm not sure we have any more questions in the chat there. Uh, if anyone wants to raise their hand or uh, unmute and ask a question, um, feel free to do so. We're now, it's been on an hour, so but we can run for another 10, 15 minutes, depending, Rob. On. Yeah. Uh, John, can I throw in a quick uh, yes. question? Philip. Uh, now, I'm sorry I'm going to bore people with this question, but um, I'm just curious about the confidence interval in the, um, in the index. You say that you apply a standard. Now, I'm not an, a statistician, so uh, my... my um, but you say that you apply a standard confidence interval across yeah. all the countries and that uh, you use, overall, you use 13 different, but in Ireland, you're only using seven. So yeah. is that the... Might look a little bit different when there's only seven data used in Ireland. Um, Again, yeah, my hands up, I, but I'm it, just wondering about that. Yeah, so the, the standard error ranges from I think in Estonia's case, where they use 10 sources, um, standard error there is 0.87. Um, uh, to uh, let's see which is the highest we're looking at here 5.8 in the case of the Bahamas, which only use three. Um, our standard error is 2.15. So lowest, the lower confidence interval is 68.47. So Ireland could be scoring as low as 68, or it would be, yeah, 68 points out of 100, and as high as 75. Uh, so either way, when you compare it to the other, to the finding, that, that's where it, 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 it suggests that we're, we're, we are underperforming in comparison to our Northern European neighbours. Um, it's John, it's, if I may, it's the, the it's publication of the, consistent. Sorry, Rob. The, the, the publication of standard errors was a welcome reform from from TI uh, a few years back because it did give a sense that these are estimates uh, and it gave you some sense of where the overlaps might be. Um, and you know, the way I always say it, it probably means something if to know that you're in the top ten versus the you know the, the next band of ten. And um, whether it means something necessary that you're eighth versus ninth, 
it's a hard to stand up. Whereas the, 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 the kind of the implied fuzziness in these estimates or the inherent fuzziness in these estimates means that you should approach them. I think the, the banding is more interesting even than the score and certainly than the, the ranking. Like where, what kind of company are you keeping? You know, we're similar to a bunch of countries and let's not lose too much sleep over whether we're slightly ahead or slightly behind of, of, of one or two. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in future years, I've, I've recommended that we perhaps um, list the countries alphabetically in the future and focus on the scores rather than on the ranking. And um, so as to avoid any misinterpretation and, you know, it, it could work against us to, in, in some degree to, to, to some degree as well. When we I met, I met a donor uh, years ago and we've struggled for funding since we set up the organization in 2004 and I asked him why you never funded us you were funding everyone else in Ireland there's a big philanthropic trust and he said because of your stupid index <laughs> and I, I said what do you mean and he said well and I made it clear we, we don't we don't compile the scores we just aggregate them or we don't gather the, the data we don't we, 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 there's no value judgment on our side um and we, we simply aggregate the data and he said, I don't care. Your data, your, your index tells us that corruption isn't a problem here. So why should we give you money? Um, and I think the fact that Ireland is considered to be at least in the top 20 least corrupt countries in the world works against us to some degree uh, because it's assumed that corruption isn't a problem. Instead, we need to look at the gap between ourselves and very top of uh, the, the, the gap in score between ourselves and the likes of Denmark and, and New Zealand, um, we 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 would be getting a a B um, a B minus uh, if anything compared to um, our counterparts in New Zealand, and Denmark, who, who score eighty close to ninety out of one hundred consistently um, every year and. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, as I said, it's easy to, to misinterpret the data. Yeah, I, one follow on then, just a st st story I'm fond of telling my students when I'm teaching them about things like the CPI. I used to live in Finland for many years, great country, does really well in all kinds of metrics of corruption. But while I was living there, the head of the Helsinki Vice Squad was on trial for selling drugs. You know, every country has a problem with corruption and sometimes complacency as I said earlier, can let it get out of hand quite um, And I think it was in Denmark, there was a senior civil servant who went on the on the run with several millions of social welfare money that she embezzled over a career. And I think that was the year Denmark was hosting the big anti-corruption conference as well. So there is, there is corruption everywhere and we shouldn't be misled by a country being close to the top. There's in no way um, evidence or an argument that there's no corruption in that country. Um, yeah, yeah. Although when I was the story I used to tell in New Zealand when I was down there um, about the former head of Murray TV, and I've forgotten his name now. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to I'm not going to risk it. Um, but uh, he was appointed. He was he had been based in Canada for a while. He was a Canadian guy, I think. I uh, was appointed in 2001, 2002 as head of Murray TV, but it lied on his CV. I had no qualification in TV production or never run uh, an organization, the organization he had said he had when being appointed. And he was sentenced, I think, to two or three years in prison for lying on the CV. And you imagine that happening here. You know, it, it, they, they, they made it, and I remember the former head of the New Zealand Post Office saying he would give colleagues first mover advantage. And he had to resign immediately. And, um, you know, you, you need to show, and I mean, I hate to point to Rudy Giuliani, uh, but um, he is given credit, rightly or wrongly, for, for taking a zero tolerance approach to crime in New York, which so then he apparently moved to the problem to New Jersey. But um, it, 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 you, you need to take a, a broken glass approach to, or broken window approach to tackling corruption you need to take a zero tolerance approach to it if if you are to to um 
build confidence, public confidence and across the board and, and uh, international confidence in your ability to, to tackle the problem. We saw this elsewhere in Finland as well and, and, and others. They, they, they are much more likely to prosecute senior officials um, and hold them to account than, than they are here. Um, so um, it's now approaching quarter past 11. I don't know if anyone else has any question. We take a couple, one or two more, if if, if you like. Uh, if not, we can we can wrap up. I see none coming in through text. Okay, Rob, any any final thoughts? Uh, no, I just think you know we have to to push on with with the important agenda is laid out by the, the Hamilton report and by yourselves and, and as we've said repeatedly and uh, not get complacent and not leave any crack for for things to get worse yeah I suspect we'll be here saying the same thing in 2022 as we should because uh, even if we do all these reforms there'll be more to do um, and that's that's the I think the great message uh, of or the great lesson of, of anti-corruption around the world yeah Indeed. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we will be launching two reports, our uh, National Integrity Index private sector report, which uh, will uh, assess uh, 30 companies uh, against their commitment to, to um, tackling corruption and promoting transparency. That's due to be published next month, as is our Safe Haven report on uh, the laundering of um, stolen assets from overseas, international corruption, and the repatriation of those stolen assets. So those are two reports to look out for next month. Um, so, you know, we still operate the Speak Up helpline only the Friday 10 to 6, um, uh, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And um, our, um, uh, our, our, our um, continuing to, to uh, expand the uh, the the integrity of work program with employers here too. So there's lots going on. Um, as I said, this recording being on on YouTube, uh, and I can make the, the 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 presentation available as well, a PDF uh, for those who want it. So thanks again for for joining us. I hope you found it informative, and um, yeah, look forward to uh, seeing you again in the not too distant future. Thanks very much. Thanks, John. Thanks, Philip. Good seeing you. Cheers. Thank you very much, John.